how does one even begin to give a TED Talk? I was feeling pretty nervous about this, so I checked out Brene Brown's vulnerability TED Talk with like 57 million views. Wow, that was a really good presentation. <sighs> Unlike Brene, I don't have a PhD in this topic, nor have I written a book on the subject. But what I do have is over a decade of experience working to close the opportunity gap for our nation's students. And I have a new idea that I believe in, an idea that I think could help improve some people's lives. And because of this, I feel like it is an idea worth spreading. So in the spirit of vulnerability that I took from Brene's talk, today I'm going to take the plunge and put this new idea out into the universe. Here is the Cliff Notes version. The idea is called Jail to Jobs, and the concept is simple. Let's get those behind bars back to work by leveraging the job training infrastructure we already have in place all across the country at our community colleges. Here are some quick numbers for background. 2.3 million people are currently locked up in the US. About half are in state prisons, about a quarter are in local jails, about 15% are in federal prisons, and the rest are mostly in immigration detention and youth centers. For each person behind bars, it costs taxpayers $30,000 annually, according to the Vera Institute of Justice. Nearly all, 95% of people who are incarcerated will return to our communities. But then, one in four will be arrested again in the same year. We have got to break this cycle of jail to jail and make it jail to jobs. Education and job training is the key to breaking the cycle. RAND estimates that people who participate in education programs while in prison have a 43% lower chance of being rearrested than those who do not. And what I don't get is why would we only provide educational opportunities to prisoners when they're locked up? Why not continue that successful education and job training model when they're released so they can get right on a path to employment? And you know, we wouldn't need to recreate a whole national system of job training for re-entering adults. We already have an entire adult learning infrastructure in place at our community colleges. Community colleges are key to national criminal justice reform. If you'll give me a few minutes, I'll back up here and tell you a little bit about who I am and why I think this topic is important. So I grew up in a beautiful small town in the heart of Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. As a kid, I was really into inventions. I was always keeping lists of ideas in those little Lisa Frank notebooks. For example, incremental brake lights. When you slam on the brakes, the light shines bright to prevent the car behind you from rear-ending you. Whereas if you just tap the brake softly, it's a softer light. I digress, but you get the point. Small town kid with lots of ideas led to my becoming an entrepreneur today. I was lucky enough to attend the University of Virginia. And even though grounds, AKA campus, was only 40 minutes from my hometown, it felt like another universe. When the time came to enter the real world and look for a job, this small town kid with lots of ideas suddenly didn't have a clue. And it got me thinking, how did anyone? While pondering this question with my friend Annie one night over pizza in DC, our frustration turned into something much more familiar, an idea. What if just using the video chat on the phones that we were holding in our hands right then and there, we created opportunities for kids to meet and engage and ask questions of diverse career role models from all walks of life, kind of like speed dating, but for discovering your professional passion. And in this moment, the seeds were planted for Dream Wakers, a national education technology nonprofit that Annie and I went on to co-found. At our core, Dream Wakers believes kids can't be what they can't see. By shining a light on the depth and breadth of career choices available in the real world, we want to awaken the hopes and dreams and yes, ideas within students across the country particularly those in low-income urban and rural communities about the opportunities that lie ahead after graduation. 
Six years out from founding DreamWakers, I'm proud to share that this simple, scalable, student-focused idea has served over 25,000 students from 600 schools in 43 states by connecting them with speakers from over 400 companies, places like Apple, Nike, Twitter, and organizations like NASA, the White House, and the U.S. State Department. In effect, offering a bridge for the two-thirds of U.S. employers who report having little to no interaction with our public schools. There are two key takeaways I've learned from spending time with DreamWakers and students across the country while turning this idea into a reality. Number one, whether it's unequal access to reliable Wi-Fi or insufficient funding for arts programs, I know for certain that intelligence is equally distributed across our schools but opportunity is not. And two, it's key to directly link learning to earning. These are the same components of the new idea I wanna to share today, an idea to create another simple, scalable, student-focused opportunity to again use the existing technology at our fingertips to link classrooms to careers, but for another one of our country's vulnerable populations formerly incarcerated individuals. I call the concept jail to jobs. So how did I get this idea? The idea came from just sitting down with what would become the most important book I have ever read, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. It tells the story of the author Stevenson, a young lawyer who founded the Equal Justice Initiative, a legal practice dedicated to defending the most desperate and in need the poor, wrongly condemned, and children who have been raped and abused in prison. In summary, Just Mercy made clear that mass incarceration is an urgent national emergency. I felt heartbroken and depressed when I finished reading this book. I felt so detached from the world that Stevenson had just taken me to, so I went back to look up more about Stevenson. I came across a speech he gave at Texas Lutheran University where he said, quote, we cannot create justice without getting close to places where injustices prevail. We have to get proximate. We have to get proximate. This was my aha moment, as Oprah would say. The fact that I had no real ties to the criminal justice system was a really big problem. So I set out to try to get proximate. I became a fellow with social entrepreneurship at the University of Virginia, and within a few weeks, I was having conversations with corrections administrators, parole officers, and formerly incarcerated men and women. I did a lot of listening, and I constantly found myself reflecting on dream wakers. Through my experience of working in Title I classrooms across the country, I'd seen firsthand the power of exposing kids to role models, or as we call them, real models, inspiring professionals, who just talk to kids and share the real stories and struggles behind those polished LinkedIn profiles. And when kids see someone they can relate to, whether another first-generation immigrant or a first-generation college student working in jobs they didn't even know existed, they get excited and hopeful about a future of possibility. On the other hand, the more I talked to folks who had done time, they described the longing that they had felt when they were in jail the longing to be back out into the real world, to have their freedom, to set goals, to stay clean, to be off the streets, to start a new life. But the reality of being able to secure a good job to provide for one's family once back out in the real world would often, between employer discrimination and skills gaps in particular, quickly feel like a pipe dream for many. Like it felt like they were expected to fail. For example, Ruben Gona, a U.S. Navy veteran who did 10 years in federal prison but now is out and is a successful entrepreneur, told me that when he was released, the correction officer said as he walked out the door, can't wait to see you back here. They're just that used to seeing folks come right back in the system. I had known that the U.S. is the most incarcerated country on the planet, but in reading more, I learned that at least one in four men who go to jail will be arrested again in the same year. Why? According to the Prison Policy Initiative, it has a lot to do with how difficult it is for them to quickly secure a quality job, especially in those two critical years after release. If they had the opportunity to land a good job, re-entering individuals would have such a better chance of success in other areas of their life as well, housing, parenting, and healthcare. 
And this isn't some charity solution. Paving a path to get folks from jail to a job would lead to safer communities and a more robust economy. And don't get me wrong, there are many organizations across the country that offer gold standard programming, support, housing, employment reentry trainings, shout out to the Fortune Society in New York, to the Anti-Recidivism Coalition in LA, and to The Way Out in Milwaukee, which by the way, was founded by Ruben, who I just mentioned in the earlier story, who are doing the work and have taught me so much in my research. But what I keep getting stuck on is the question of scale. This is a national problem. There are more people behind bars than live in the entire city of Dallas. One in three black boys born today will go to jail at some point in their lives. And one out of 37 adults in the US is under correctional supervision, according to the NAACP. And let this sink in. Spending on prisons and jails has increased at triple the rate of spending on pre-K-12 education over the last 30 years. So, how can we begin to reverse this national problem? It has got to be with a national solution. Just as America's community colleges played a critical role in spurring the economic recovery after the Great Recession, so too can our community colleges play a critical role in building back a strong post-COVID economy. Thanks to extensive research from organizations like RAND, we know that recidivism is about 43% lower when individuals participate in community college-led programs while in prison. So why keep this wildly successful, proven education intervention locked up behind bars? Why not scale this best practice beyond prison walls and offer the same kind of community college career technical education programs to re-entering individuals when they need it most? right when they're released out into the real world and urgently need a good job. Better yet, let's reimagine these programs for our current job market, where a growing number of new collar career paths demand a specific set of specialized skills, but not necessarily a traditional bachelor's degree. Companies like IBM, Zoom, and Google have all recognized the need to reevaluate their hiring process to focus on skill sets versus expensive four-year diplomas. In fact, many companies have even established their own trainings and certificates to help reskill workers to meet current demand. Instead of creating their own programs, I believe those companies should focus their resources on partnering up with our existing community colleges and offer the same career technical education opportunities to re-entering individuals. And they can do this through something I propose we call the American Workforce Association, AWA, a community college career technical education program designed specifically for re-entering individuals. AWA accreditation would be prestigious and standard and nationwide and would signal to employers across the country and even around the globe that this re-entering individual with AWA credentials has met rigorous skills and background check requirements. For example, the AWA certification could at once verify that a candidate has produced negative drug tests, complied with parole requirements, completed necessary technology assessments, and successfully mastered a certain skill, such as coding or welding. So just like accreditations with the American Medical Association or the way that SAT scores are the same for a student, whether they're graduating in Detroit or Miami, the same thing would apply for our national infrastructure of AWA upskilling. They would both help re-entering individuals and employers match job seekers with appropriate jobs. The national infrastructure linking prisons to community colleges and employers is key for efficiency to scale. I have to say it again, the national infrastructure is critical, not because I'm trying to preach big government here, actually the opposite because the national infrastructure is key for private sector buy-in. We essentially need like a dating app to make matches, to match what employers are hiring for with the skills our workers have to offer. And I wanna mention also, former incarcerated individuals aside, the current state-by-state -state credentialing and certification process is a bit of an inefficient hot mess at the moment. Creating a national Skillshare database that includes AWA credentialing would solve a lot of the problems for our employers and unemployed folks all across the board. As was the case with Dreamwakers, no novel technology is needed. 
We simply should harness the tools that we already have at our fingertips to connect classrooms to careers, to connect learning to earning. Along the way, a career coach specifically trained to help re-entering individuals secure a new job should also be on staff at our community colleges. And ideally, that coach would be someone who was once themselves incarcerated. Just as with Dreamwakers, we really cannot overstate the importance of seeing someone who has been in their shoes, who in this case has also been incarcerated, make it. The case for investing in AWA is further illustrated through conversations I've had with employers that went pretty much something like this, me. Would you consider hiring an employee with a criminal record? Is this off the record? Yes, it's off the record. The answer is no. Why? Because they're criminals. Well, what if they had some sort of national certification verifying that they had the skills and had rehabilitated? And often they said something like this, yeah, I would consider it, but just hiring someone out of the blue with a criminal record, I don't wanna sound like a bad guy, but why would I want to? I don't have time for anything like that. But yeah, I like the idea of third-party verification. I would consider hiring them with that. As with business, we know that timing is everything and the time is right for jail to jobs in Washington. Consider these three points. Number one, in December 2020, Congress voted to lift a 26-year ban on Pell Grants for people in prison. This is a game changer. It means that incarcerated people can once again apply for federal Pell Grants in order to pay for college classes. Two, on the campaign trail, President Biden proposed free community college for all and a $50 billion investment in workforce training, including community college business partnerships. And finally, number three, criminal justice reform actually is one of those rare causes that has bipartisan support. As this New York Times article noted in November 2020, Republicans and Democrats actually agree, you can be for law and order and you can be for second chances. This is our moment. Let's act now to close this revolving door, shuttling millions of Americans from jail to jail. Instead, let's innovate at scale with the resources we've already got, our community colleges, to get half a million of our fellow citizens from jail to a job, to get our economy back to business, and to get our generation on the right side of history. We might not get a second chance. Thank you very much for your time.